So, let's see. I got onto the Sheraton Conference Wi-Fi. And, uh, oh, my password's not here. The password was Sheraton12, but with a capital S, Sheraton. Oh, okay, never mind. The password's not here. You go, so you log on, you go to their website, and they have a, they ask for auth code there. And the auth code you put under the web page is Sheraton with a capital S, 12. And then you hit enter, and then it redirects you to their advertising site, I guess, to make you buy stuff. I don't know. I get why people do that, but I was a little insulting at this point. <clears throat> already bought a room here. Come on. All right, ranting. Um, where to begin? All right, so uh, Microsoft finally ditched Internet Explorer, right? Oh, yeah, and they gave it, they gave, they're giving all the products cool Halo names now. They got Cortana and Spartan, and what else are they doing? Trying to, I guess, get as far away from the Balmer days as possible. That'll be a healthy, con uh, healthy uh, change for him, though. Actually, it looks like we're already recording. So. Oh, so this is going to go on YouTube? Yep. Wow. All right. Well, thanks for showing up this morning, guys. I know it's bright and early. Uh, welcome to day two of B-Sides. Um, if you haven't noticed, downstairs we've got some vendors, and they could use some love. Um, they've pretty much made this happen. Um, you know, we got a pretty cool badge and a bunch of things for $40. And uh, the only reason we are able to do that was because the vendor's downstairs. So go pick up some free swag, put your name on a list if you want more information from them. Um, and it would be appreciated. So uh, this is Eric Fowler? Failer. Failer. Eric Failer. Um, this presentation is sponsored by Workfront. And it's uh, from Vim Muggle to Wizard in 10 easy steps. Um, Eric is a longtime Linux power user um, and Vim exponent. That's right. What's, what's a Vim exponent? Someone that um, evangelizes Vim. Ah. Gets, gets everybody into it. Oh, you guys are in for a treat then. Um, he likes software that's elegant, useful, and avoids putting too many features too many features, we're talking about them, uh, between the user and their goal. He's currently pursuing a master's degree in computer science at USU and is the, leader, is the lead RAS engineer at Spillman Technologies. Um, I had the pleasure last night of talking a bit with Eric. Um, I think you guys are in for a real treat here. Um, I think VIM is one of those tools that uh, we too often don't think about and just use all the time. So VI is... It's more than just a text editor. It's become a way of life for power users who can get more done than their peers who use traditional pointy clicky editors. Notepad++, sublime, looking at you. In this talk, you will uncover an unseen world inhabited by wizards who effortlessly modify their code to use, using powerful commands built upon surprisingly simple concepts. It's Eric's goal to invite you into this world and arm you with 10 of the most useful Vi concepts, giving you the biggest personal productivity boost that can be had in 50 minutes. He's going to discuss the most successful Vi clone of them all, Vim, which is available on just about any platform you might encounter and has been actively developed for over 20 years. He's going to also explore NeoVim, a project that seeks to modernize and streamline the world's best editor. Let's give it up for Eric. Thank you. Make sure that doesn't break anybody's eardrums. Um, yeah, thanks for being here and coming to the only not computer security talk at the computer security conference. I'm really pleased to have you here. So uh, when he said uh, too many features between the user and their goal, what I mean by that is features that don't help you get to your goal. Vim definitely has a lot of features. It's not lacking in that department. But uh, the problem with a lot of other programs isn't that they don't have enough features. It's just that they have too much stops you from what you're trying to do. All right, hang on a minute. And what was the, there's the one. All right, so Vim Muggle to Wizard, 10 easy steps. How many of you consider yourselves muggles? All right, so you'd be the guy in the left on the handsome red shirt, but we're going to turn you into a wizard, give you a little pointy wizard hat by the end of this thing, and you're going to be flying through your text. This is a tool that you know, we use all the time no matter what our specific job is, and there's a lot of productivity gains to be had for anybody. So about me, um, like you said, I'm studying a uh, master's in computer science at Utah State University. 
My name's pronounced Failer. Eric Failer rhymes with epic failure, so don't feel bad about hurting my feelings saying it that way. I have been using Vim virtually every day since 2003, and it dawned on me when I was putting this together that that was as long ago as 12 years ago, and that's as long as I was in public school, and it doesn't really seem like it was that long ago. It doesn't feel like 12 years. In fact, I couldn't really think of anything that's distinctively 2003, about 2003, so I had to go to Google to see what happened then, and this wasn't a good year. <laughs> so with a title like Vim Muggle to Wizard, I'm kind of implying there's a dichotomy. There's two kinds of users in the world. You got people that I'm going to say are from user culture. That's who I'll call the muggles. And programmer culture people. These are wizards. So what, what do you guys think is the distinction between these two cultures? What makes a user a user? What makes a programmer a wizard? Anybody? Don't make me call on you. Okay, we've got experience. Efficiency. I'd say a desire to efficiency. Yes. Well, I think it, I think it's a little more than just efficiency. It's, it comes down to user friendliness, operability. Mm-hmm. Everybody can use the plug and play interface, and a lot of people, especially with them, a lot of people don't want to sit down. And there's all these people in the coverage who do. It's a lot more efficient. Not just friendly, but efficient. All right. So that's exactly it. Okay, I dispute the user friendliness thing because I feel like editors that don't give you a chance to get better at the editor and really use it well, or they're actually antagonistic towards you as a user. But at the early stage when you're first coming into it, certainly a friendliness issue. That curve. Yeah, all right. So that's, that's what I want to talk to you about. That's what I'm hopefully going to convince you about is that the learning curve isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing. So muggles in general, the, the way they approach their computer, it's a specific tool for a specific task. They have apps, and this app does this. That app does that, and they kind of keep them in those containers. They don't care how the app works, just as long as they can get on Tumblr or use hashtags or whatever they're doing these days. And they want it to look pretty. I, I don't understand iPads. I don't understand the appeal there, other than they just look neat. They look like something that we grew up watching on Saturday morning cartoons. But, it, I mean, to use the thing, uh, it just defends every sensibility I have about you know user interface. Now, Wizards, on the other hand, we're the kind of people that we – Recognize that a computer is a computer. It's a machine that can do literally anything. It's limited only by our imagination. And it, it does stuff on its own. It's automated. So we can set it to work, tell it what to do, then it's going to get the stuff done. I don't have to babysit and keep mashing buttons to make it keep going. It's not like I'm trying to push a ball uphill. It'll, it'll do it on its own. The way we use our computers is kind of part of our identity and our lifestyle. And to get invested in a tool isn't like a big thing for us because we can understand that that's going to pay off in the long run. Like, I've been using Vim for over a decade, and I feel like I'm able to do more stuff eat more easily than a lot of my peers. But most importantly, wizards, we like our computers to do our bidding and to work for us, and we just really get in- offended and insulted when the computer expects us to do stuff that the computer should be good at doing, like counting and doing a tedious task in a loop over and over again. This is, this is what computers are for, so let's make our computer do that. So my goal is to help you recognize workflows and patterns in your day-to-day that are kind of muggle-ish in the sense that you're doing dumb stuff that the computer could easily do more quick, just as dumbly but more quickly. Think about how to make your workflows more wizard-like. And then to get you started on that, you know, Vim's a really great tool to that end, but I want to give you the 10 best features that will give you the most bang for your buck. There's a lot of features. It's really hard to decide which 10 ones to go with for this, but I think these ones will get you off and running. So I mentioned there's an a interactive component to this. I want you to kind of follow along with me if you have a laptop. So go to this website, um, unavative.net. i got a tarball there with a couple of text files in it. Oh, look at this. I'm getting people at the security conference to go to a URL. Man, I am leet. I should have. Well, there will be PDFs of the slides. You can download that. Trust me, it's just the slides, guys. All right, so while you're uh, downloading that and unzipping it and getting the files out, wait, before I do that, is, is there anybody on a Windows platform here? Are you guys on Linux or Mac? Okay, well, there, there's a good way to get like a bleeding edge version of Vim on Windows, but we'll, we'll not talk about that. Instead, in the meantime, I want to talk about the history of VI. Why is Vim the way it is today and how did we get there and all that good stuff? And because we're in Utah, I feel a bit obligated to have a genealogy chart to describe this. Um, Vim has a long heritage. It descends from a line of line editors. Um, QED was one of the first ones back in the day, and 
apart from having a really cool name, it was ported to Unix by guys like Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson, like Thompson hack Ken Thompson. So you know this is basically alien technology when he writes it. What QED did was when you type in a regular expression, it would compile machine code representations of the non-deterministic finite automaton and then run that as, as the regular expression. So that was, that was pretty legit. Um, they ported to Linux, or sorry, to Unix in the 70s. Uh, Dennis Ritchie had a hand in that. And then it went through a line of revisions and um, kind of refinements. Even though Ed is the standard Unix editor, it wasn't regarded as being particularly user-friendly, so some guys tried to make it a little bit better over the years. And um, um, Bill Joy was the guy that did a lot of that work. He actually has Steve Jobs a feature from this editor called Bravo. That's Vim's redo operator. When you type a period and it redoes the last thing you just did. So glad he ripped that off. But line editors, your UI was a piece of paper. They were a teletype terminal a program for editing text on a typewriter, effectively. But instead of having a screen, you had paper. So it had some design considerations that were optimized to that environment, namely, you don't just type text by default. You start off in a command mode. You have lots of marks and buffers and registers and things that help you keep track of your work because you're really looking at one line at a time. But by the time Bill Joy got involved, he um, had this terminal, the Lear Sigler ADM3A. He had a screen so he could have a cursor that needed to be moved around the screen. Um, that's a pretty cool feature, except you'll notice on this keyboard there's not arrow cluster anywhere. This is why VI uses H, J, K, and L to move the cursor around because that's just what his terminal had. It wasn't him trying to be uber efficient or anything. That's just the limitations he had. And as a side note, like I know a lot of people, myself included, got into VI because the idea of not using the arrow keys to move the cursor seemed really leet and wizardly. But if you think about it, it's kind of a dumb argument to make the new users because you're telling them it's really inefficient to move your right hand from here to here to move the arrow keys. But then we expect people to move their left hand from here to here to mash escape all the time. Um, You'll notice here, this little uh, tab-looking key right here is actually the escape key. So for him, hitting escape wasn't a big deal. And a lot of uh, Vim users in the community will remap their caps lock key to be the escape key, just so it's, they can you know, keep the claim of being ergonomic. Um, a lot of the problems that VI and indeed those line editors were trying to solve are far, far gone. They're so obsolete now. But we're still talking about VI. Bill Joy had a 300 baud modem from his terminal to the mainframe. So his whole thing was trying to limit the bandwidth and the latency. It couldn't keep up with his thoughts. So he wanted something he could give it very few commands, but get it to do a lot of work. So he didn't have to wait for it or you know, do dumb stuff over and over again because it was really slow for him. But the reason VI has staying power and why we're still using VI-based editors 40 years later is because he accidentally got the best UI not even trying to. So let's talk about a good UI real quick. A good UI is, um, well, it's not aerobics like what Tom Cruise is doing here. In fact, a lot of people will consider VI to be the epitome of a bad UI, and they do everything wrong. So there's no GUI, no mouse support, and a lot of people feel like you need that in a text editor. You've got all these weird cryptic commands that are hard to remember. Like, unlike Control-C, that's copy, because you know copy starts with C. Control-X, of course, is cut, because cut starts, I mean, I mean, X looks like scissors, and you cut with scissors, and then naturally paste is Control-V, because the V looks like a down arrow, and you're pasting stuff down. Control Z's undo. Okay, so we all got we all got our own weird cryptic commands. VIs just don't happen to be the ones that everybody else uses. Partly because it predates that standard by a good decade. So that's a dumb argument, but it's not discoverable. There's not like tool tips and little menus to hold your hand and help you along. And that's one of those features I feel get in between you and your goal because once you know what you're doing, you don't need tool tips to remind you how to do it, right? And finally, it's a modal program. Boo, this is bad, bad stuff, you guys. You shouldn't have modes because there are significant source of errors, confusion, restrictions, and complexity. Now, if anybody other than Jeff Raskin said that, I would just, I wouldn't even put it in my slides. But this, this guy's a genius. He knows what he's talking about. But I think he really hated that original VI didn't tell you what mode you were in. Does now and all the other clones do. So I'd, if he's still alive, I'd ask him what he thought of that. But but despite all of these things that VI did wrong, lots of people, probably more people today than at any point in history, are using a VI-based editor. You know why is that? And so let's talk about the learning curve. The UIs that UI experts are designing, they're geared towards new computer users. A lot of this stuff was 
thought of in the 80s when computers weren't commonplace. So to get people to use a computer in the first place was a big feat. You had to convince them it was like a real world object they're familiar with, like a desktop. And you got emails that come to an inbox. And you had to use all these stupid abstractions and metaphors for things that as wizards, we know we're on a computer. We know it's got registers and you know operations and opcodes. I mean, that doesn't scare us or intimidate us. It just gets in the way. And furthermore, looking at this chart, what's the difference between a notepad user over here and a notepad user over here that's been using it for two years versus the guy that just started using it two weeks ago? Not an awful lot, okay? You don't just get really good at notepad. You get a little bit good at notepad, and that's as far as you can go. VI, on the other hand, yeah, sure, there's a ramp up time, but once you get to a certain point, you can start adding on new features, and these features work together, and they, they combine, and they compose, and it makes it all the more powerful all the time. UI experts that are designing for this guy, he's got this many brain cells, he knows what he's doing that well, and um, someone with this many hands. I don't think you get to call it a humane interface when it's designed for someone that you know, physiologically can't be a human being, right? Because you're in insert mode all the time, because presumably in a text editor, all you're doing is typing new text. Does anybody just open up a blank file and type a new line of text and then close it, and then the next time you type something, you... no, you're, you're like refactoring and rearranging stuff and moving crap around. That's why you're not in insert mode all the time, because that's not your most common use case. And um, as far as like iPads and touch screens go, like again, I don't think these are designed with human physiology in mind, because I can't see through my hand to tell what I'm supposed to be touching, and I can't feel what I'm touching. So my theory is that Steve Jobs was on one of his legendary acid trips, and he's watching Beetlejuice when he got the idea for the touchscreen. Because he invented that the same way Al Gore invented the internet, right? I'm pretty sure that's the marketing that leads me to believe. So VI, on the other hand, see what I did there? It unleashes your inner cyborg. You're going to be having all these commands right at your fingertips. You're going to move text around. It's going to be awesome. So let's talk about why these old school moves that Vim has are the best. First one of these is regular expression. So at this point, if you got the text file, pop open demo.txt in Vim, and then go find the regular expression section. With regular expressions, you don't have to experience the file linearly. I tried Sublime for a little while because I saw my coworkers using it. It's got that mini map on the right, and that looked really, really cool. My problem was I was editing little tiny files like Etsy FSTAB that they all fit on the screen anyways, and I didn't need a map. Or I was editing these several megabytes long Tomcat logs that the map I mean, it all looks the same on the map, and the map only shows me a few screenfuls. So that didn't buy me a lot. But at that time, I realized I don't think of the file as like a linear sequence. I use regular expressions to jump around where I need to go. I mean, we, we use computers to find stuff for us all the time. That's what Google does. And your editor should be finding stuff for you so you don't have to scroll through and search for it. You can count how many times stuff's in the file. You can make lots of these little boring, tedious, error-prone changes. You just tell the computer what to do and then let it do it. So, um, for instance, let's talk about in here, I got the word Jabberwock in here a few times. And I want to find out how many times I've, I'm saying Jabberwock in this file. So I could just highlight it as a regular expression, do a search. So it highlights it and visualizes it for me. And then I can hit N, the Vim command to, you know, go through all of them. And I can just wait till I bottom out. And then I could be counting. Wait a minute. I'm on a computer. These are really good at counting. I'll just have the computer do the counting, right? So I'm just going to run this little command here. It's a substitute command, but the end flag at the end doesn't actually change it. I'm just doing it for the side effect, because at the bottom of the screen, if you can see that, it tells me there are eight matches on eight different lines. I got the computer to count this for me stupid fast, because, you know, again, computers are really good at that stuff. Well, let's say, okay, so I got a bit of a confession to make. I, um, I'm into Lewis Carroll, George Lucas crossover fanfic. I like um, Lewis Carroll poems, but I don't like all the nonsense words that he puts in there that just don't mean anything. I want them to be grounded in some kind of reality, perhaps in a galaxy far, far away, where there are nonsense words or actual real things that I've seen on a screen before, and there's canon behind it. It means something. I'm very passionate about that. So let's give Jabberwocky the George Lucas Hanshot first treatment. I want to change all these Barragoves. Does anybody know what those are? No. Well, let's change them to midichlorians. Does anybody know what those are? But well, it doesn't matter, but they sound cooler. It's plausible, right? Okay, so I made four substitutions of four lines, and now Jabberwocky's getting somewhere. Because it's about midichlorians. That's, that's, that's good, guys. All right, um, at the end of all these sections in the file, I've got a help command. Vim has got really, really good documentation, and you don't have to go out to the web to get it. This is an important point, because if you're using Vim to fix your 
your um, R, you'll see your inetd file or your um, hosts file or your DNS lookup file, your resolve.conf, that's the one. If you're fixing that and you can't go to the web to get help files, you're kind of hosed, right? So it's got all that stuff just installed by default, so use it. Okay, so regular expressions, takeaway. They do the stuff that computers are good at, so you don't have to. Let's talk about marks. Not, th not those marks. Marks are like bookmarks. These are things that keep track of where you are in the file. It doesn't change your text file. It's not like you put a comment in the file like I usually do that says bookmark. It's something that's internal to Vim. And if, if VI and Vim can keep track of where you are in the file, then you can use that to your advantage and then tell it to do stuff based on that. What I'm in right here, this is actually traditional VI. This is the same source code that Bill Joy originally wrote. It's since been open source and it's been ported to build on Linux. So for historical purposes, it's kind of fun. It's just kind of fun to go back and see how much of this new Vim stuff still works even back in the day. We'll set a mark. I'll set a mark here. Marks have names, uh, one character names. You've got 26 letters on the keyboard, so there's 26 marks you can use by default. Type M and then the name of the mark. So I'll set mark A right there. And over here, I'm going to put mark B. To jump to a mark, use the single quote command. Single quote A takes me back to the line where my A mark is. Single quote B puts me down here on the B line. If I want to go back to the exact character cell that I set the mark in, that's the other single quote, your back tick. Back tick B puts me back on that S, which is where I set the mark. OK, well, that's kind of useful. You just got to remember what mark you're using. But the real powerful thing is that you can tell Vim to do stuff based on those marks. And Vim has actually been setting marks for you, and you probably didn't even know it. Useful marks, the uh, square bracket marks. The opening square bracket marks the point where you first made a change, or yanked text for that matter, then the other square bracket marks the end of that region. So if you paste in a big block of text and you need to do something to that block of text you pasted in, you can tell Vim what you're talking about. You start a command, you say single quote, that brace, single quote, this other brace, and then you tell it what command you want, and it'll do it. Well, I set the A mark and the B mark. Oh, they don't have that in this. That was embarrassing. So I'll indent the stuff that I marked previously. I don't have to be looking at it. It could be scrolled way off the screen. It could have been something I did 20 minutes ago. As long as those marks are still valid, VI can find them, and it can operate on that text. So VI has been setting those marks for you. You might as well start using them. X commands. These are the command line commands from the line editor heritage from way back in the day. And this is probably a feature a lot of new people don't like because, oh my gosh, it's typing. Heaven forbid I'm in a text editor and they expect me to be able to type. Right? The great thing about these commands, it's not because there's a whole bunch of them, but it's because you can apply them with sniper-like precision to exactly the text you want to using any of the above mentioned methods. Okay? You can give a command a range of lines to operate on, and you can either tell it line numbers, you can use the marks that you've been setting, you can use regular expressions. You don't even have to have seen the text. If you know there's a, a certain pattern in your file, you can tell the editor to operate on it, say from here until the next time you see this word, do something. So um, last week, so, so I had a directory of all my Lewis Carroll, George Lucas crossover fanfic. And um, I got a guest account on one of my computers, and one of my guests logged in, elevated the privileges, and they deleted all my fanfic. And it was just totally devastating. I, could, I don't know why someone would do that, first of all. But this person was a bit of a noob. They didn't cover the tracks very well. I got their bash history file. So I've got a timestamp. I know when they committed the crime. Okay, It was around this time they did it. But I don't know which one of my users it was, because they all log into the same guest account. But if I got the last log, and I can see what IP address logged in at that time, I'll know who I need to slam the band hammer down on. Problem is these uh, timestamps aren't exactly readable. All right, so what we're going to do here, I'm going to run this command. It's going to go from the current line plus 2, so the first timestamp line, down to from the current line plus 76, which is the end of this region. I'm going to run this uh, gnarly looking substitute command on it, but what this does, um, that's probably worse because you can't see it at the bottom. What this is going to do, it's going to find a digit followed by a hash sign and substitute it with the output of the strf time built in Vim function. So it's going to take the Unix epoch time, turn it into something that I can read, then I'm going to ban somebody. Okay, so now these are all readable. So I'll go back to shell code, and I can see the crime happened around 12.10 p.m. on the 15th of March. So now all i got to do is see who is logged in then. 
I'm going to prosecute them. Oh, yeah. How dare they? All right. Now, uh, one, one of the tricks I just did back there, I'll show you this real quick, because editing these command lines is fun, but you're in Vim. You expect to do some Vim stuff, but on the command line at the bottom, it's kind of more Emacs-y. You use Control-W to delete a word, and that's okay. That's, that's good in a pinch, but if you really want to do something awesome, when you're in command line mode, hit Control-F, and it's going to pop up your complete command history, the last you know, 50 or 100 lines or whatever the default is. This is a Vim buffer. All the Vim tricks you know and love you can use in here. And then when you're done, you hit enter, and then it's going to execute that command for you. So I'll save you a ton of time. That's a really good, that's a really good one. Registers. Just like Mark's, Vim has been putting stuff into registers for you. You guys know what registers are? These are the, in, in, in other desktop environments, it's the cut and paste clipboard because there's only one of them. Um, in VI, we've got lots of them. We've got dozens of them. But the other awesome thing about them is that you can tell VI to use the text in that register as though it was a VI command. So it's a macro. All right. So th this is the really great part. Registers are good. Um, anytime you delete stuff, it goes into a stack of registers. There's a default register, which is you know the one that when you just hit the P command to paste from. That's the double quote. Anything, anything you change, like with the delete command, or if you yank, it's going to go into the default register, whose name is double quote. But then if you yank stuff, there's the zero register, which is the default yank register. So now your text is in two places. When you delete stuff, it goes into the double quote register and also goes into register number one. Then it shifts register one into register two and so on. So right at your fingertips, you're keeping the last ten things you've deleted. That's, that comes in really handy if you accidentally delete too much and you want to get it back. Well, you sure can. So like marks, you use a, a quote mark to introduce that you're referring to a register. So it's the double quote when you're talking about registers. But the cool thing is that these are macros. So let's say I want to do something that's a little bit tricky to do as a regular expression. What I typed out right here are the VI commands that I would do to do this particular operation. Now that's not important, though, because if you hit the Q command, and you type the name of a register, it'll say recording in the corner. How many of you guys have done that accidentally and didn't know what you're doing? Type Q again to turn that off. So Q, the name of a register, like say register A, and then you do some stuff like go down three lines and hit Q. If I type at sign A, it's going to execute. It's going to take the text in register A and then do it as a VI command. So you can show Vim what you want to do and then tell it to do it again and again. So in this case, I've got this text here. Um, this corresponds to a command I want to do. I've got an escape character right here, so it gets out of insert mode, and then I type a J, so it goes down to the next line. So I don't even have to do that again manually. So let's just load this up into register A. What I want to do, I was writing a mail merge for some of my friends, and I had you know personalized greetings at the beginning of my mail messages, but they're a little bit too honest, and I thought maybe some of them would be offended by that, so I thought I should just change it to something generic and bland and unoffensive. Probably could have done this with a regular expression, but you know, it's a little bit tricky. So I'll just do the macro thing. So if I say at sign A, it's going to change the offending word into my good. So now it says, hello there, my good fellow. Well, I just typed at sign A three times. All right? Like, what do I look like, a noob? It would be nice if Vim could just remember the last macro I executed so I didn't have to tell it every time, right? And, and it can. So that's at sign, at sign. I type at sign, at sign, it remembers the last macro I did. Um, but now I'm typing you know, two keystrokes for every one thing I want to do. When I go to the grocery store and I buy stuff at the checkout register, the lady you know, takes my Hungry Man meals and she doesn't scan them all individually. She scans the first one, types in how many there are, and then puts them in the bag. Well, can't my editor do that too? Well, it sure can. I'll just tell it i got six more lines here. I'm going to go six, at, at. And it's going to do it. Because remember, the last command, the last part of that macro was the J key to go down to the next line. So it just automatically puts the cursor right where it needs to be, and then it does it that many times. Okay? Start thinking like that, and you're going to get your job done a lot easier. Now, what if you don't know there's six more lines, right? Well, you can just tell it some crazy big number, and then when it gets to the end of the file, or if your command errors out because you know the command can't work, like you've got a regular expression in there, it'll just bail out. So you don't even have to know how many you got in there. You just tell it to do it a bunch of times, and then when it gets done, it gets done. Okay, so the point here is that data is code. So let's talk about language. Language is important because, I mean, everything we do to the computer, you can think of in terms of a language and how we get our point across to the computer, what we want to do. 
there's a lot of these new editors coming out. You got Sublime, you got Atom, and they look really, really cool, but they really just miss the point, and they're never going to replace VI because your interaction with the computer is the important part, not how it looks. And they're all still, you know, using the mouse, and you got to point and highlight and click. And I mean, let's be honest, how, how good does that really work? There's UI guidelines for how big UI elements like buttons are supposed to be because if they're too small, people have a hard time clicking them. Now you want people to put their cursor onto a character in their text file. And if, they're any, you know, if their eyesight's any good at all, they're going to be using a tiny font so they can see a lot. I mean, come on, guys. The reason that VI is never going away, the reason it's been around for 40 years is because it's a language. It's a simple language, and if you understand these basic concepts, all these weird cryptic commands all of a sudden make sense. You've got three things in this language. You've got a count, you've got an operator, and you've got a motion. That's, that's really all there is to it. The count part's optional. A lot of people leave it off because you're just doing one thing at a time. But if you're ever doing more than one thing at a time, don't do that thing multiple times. Tell VI how many times to do it and let VI do it. Operator, these are some of the commands that you're very familiar with out of normal mode. Anytime you type a command, but you need to type some other key to make it finish, those are operators, not just commands. Um, like the D command. DD takes two characters to delete a line. That's because D caret will delete from the cursor to the beginning of the line. Or DJ will delete from here down a line. You see where I'm going with this? The really clever bit is the motion. You've got lots of ways in VI to position the cursor where you want to be. Because it's aware that text has things like words and lines and sentences and paragraphs. If we've got names and concepts and words for these things, shouldn't the editor have a notion of what these things are? And this is the part of VI that really makes it brilliant because you can have these basic things you need to do to text, and you have basic ways to describe how much text you want to refer to, and then you put the two together, and there's your cryptic command. Wow, I hope I didn't confuse anybody there because that's just so hard. Anything that you're using to move the cursor pretty much counts as a motion. So marks that we talked about, that's a motion. Regular expressions act as a motion in this context. Our beloved H, J, K, and L keys, this is the part that makes them awesome because they're not just moving the cursor. It tells VI where you want to go and what, what you want to do when you get there. Now here's another quote from a man, Jeff Raskin. Computers shall not waste your time or require you to do more work than is strictly necessary. Is your editor wasting your time? Is it making you do more work than necessary? If you're not using VI, it probably is. Just saying. So remember, COM, count, operator, motion. N now you're a Vim wizard. So um, Vim's been around for a little while. Um, VI has been around for a long time. Uh, where, where are we going in the future? What's going to happen next? So under the auspices of Brahm Molinar, the BDFL of Vim, it's been, it's been a very strong and stable project. They're putting patches out every week. But over the years, the code's gotten a bit crufty, and Brahms become a bit reluctant to change things. He's gotten burned by different patch sets. People really, really need this feature in VI or in Vim, and he'll put it in. And then when the bug reports start rolling in, they're long gone. They're not maintaining it. So he's got all this other stuff that he gets to maintain on top of you know, already being a big project. So he's kind of gotten a little bit reluctant to make big sweeping changes over the years. And that's really kind of gotten some people in the community fed up and tired. So... Last year, a guy named Tiago de Ahuda made a bounty source project. He wanted to fork Vim and do some really radical and drastic things to it. And when he started out, I really didn't think it was going to go anywhere, but I'm willing to eat my hat because in the last month or two, they've really come a long ways and have gotten it going pretty good. So it's called NeoVim. They've done a lot of neat things. They're cleaning up the code. They're using some uh, more modern libraries to abstract certain things out, make it you know, more cross-platform. Downside is their cross-platform libraries aren't on all the platforms. So some of the platforms I use Vim on, NeoVim's not ever going to be supported on. So I'm a bit miffed about that. But there are some cool things like in the TTY layer, you can distinguish Control-I from Tab. So you can use Control-I in a mapping in the console. That'll work in GVim, but if you do it in the console, the console just sees it as a Tab character. So they're doing some cool stuff. It's definitely worth checking out if you're not afraid of building your own software. Um, it's a bit alpha-y right now. Just be aware of that, but it's, it's pretty neat. It's going somewhere. All right, so let's talk about some uh, external tools, some external programs. How many of you know a Unix system? You're comfortable there. All right. So VI, or sorry, Vim, it's a component among other components. It's designed to work well with stuff that's already on your computer instead of being a kitchen sink 
IDE, and all be all kind of you know, big bloaty program. You got all these great programs on your computer, so Vim should work with them. That's the VI way, work in harmony. We can pull in text from another file with the read command, but as we know on Unix, we consider just about anything a file. It's really easy to pull in the contents of a command. So I can read in, for example, this ls command. I want to see how many types of syntax Vim can highlight out of the box. So I'll just run this command, and 582 more lines in my file. So there's at least 582 types of syntax that Vim, just out of the box, vanilla, will highlight, which I think is always really cute when I go to the editor and go to their syntax menu, and there's like a couple dozen entries. For some reason, I'm writing a script, and for some reason, if I needed bsides.org's um, IP address in my script, I could just not go to another X term and run NSLOOKUP and cut and paste it back in. I'll just do it in here because I'm already in Vim and it's already on Unix. We're really blurring the line between text in files on a computer and text just that can come from anywhere. Now say I want to go the other way. What if I got some text in my text file or whatever I'm editing right now, and I want to push it out to another program, process it, and then bring it back in? Well, that's what the bang command does. I can do stuff like run some text through Figlet. Whoops, not like that though. I've got to tell it what text. Figlet. Okay. Or cow say. This comes in handy sometimes. One thing I started doing, um, people are asking me, how do you do stuff in Vim? What do I need to put in my Vim RC? And I was just about to grab the mouse and highlight the snippet and then paste it in the chat window. Then I thought, that's what a muggle would do. I'm better than this. So, I can highlight some text, run it through paste bin it. Oops, got to use the bang, so I just taught you guys. All right, anybody want to go to that website and tell me if that's really what, what's there? I'll screw it, I'll just do it. Oh, that was embarrassing. Hey, oh, you don't believe me? You thought I just hit undo, right? Yeah. So um, what, what I just did there, um, I made a mapping because I like to type out a command like I'm going to type it on the shell. I, I do that very often. So I just made this mapping that will um, take the text, put my shell in front of it, and then the text. So basically it's like passing this command to my shell and runs that and then puts the output back into my editor. So that's uh, this guy right down here. No remap, capital Q, bang, bang, sh, and the bang, bang says take the current line as, an, as a normal mode command, basically. Take the current line and run it through this command. It's my shell, so whatever I type on there like a command, it'll do. Put that in your vimrc, that'll be awesome. Who knows what the capital Q command in vim does? That's what I thought. Trust me, you won't miss it. If I need a list of all the users on my system, bam, capital Q, I know. How much battery life do I have? What's the prime factorization of two of my favoritest numbers? Right? Say my iCloud account got hacked again. I need to set up a new password. Done. Okay? Now, if I need to do something like a, a hexadecimal times table, right? I, I know how to do that with Unix commands. I could write like a one off Python or Perl script to do that, but I know I could just use seek to print out the sequence of numbers, then print f to format them as, you know, hexadecimal. But, you know, what I really wanted was a table. So if I pass that through format, I just think there's you know, going to be 16 things on a line, two characters per digit plus a space, so that's three characters. So I've got 48 characters. There's a new line at the end. Well, simple math. Bam, I've got my times table, just like that. Okay? We're turning our text buffer into a text stream, and we have any other program on our computer that can take text, can manipulate it, plug it back into what we're doing. You don't need other terminals. You don't need to cut and paste anything. All right? It's the way to be, guys. Wow, what did I do? Ooh, let's guess. I think I was on slide 40. Oh, that's a pretty good guess. Da, 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 da. All right, this is where we want it to be. We're going to do the splits. It's not uncomfortable. It's not awkward, guys. I promise. Splitting windows, this is one of the greatest features of Vim. It's very flexible. A lot of other editors, um, Visual Studio, they let you split it like down the middle or maybe down the middle this way. Or some of them like do a grid. And that's, that's very, very confining. Vim's like a tiling window manager. You can open the same file in five different places at once, or you can open five different files in 
you know, five little views at once. And Vim doesn't care, it just puts it up there. The way you do that is the Control W command puts you kind of in the sub mode where the next character refers to some window operation. Now, a lot of the commands that you're already familiar with, like moving the cursor up, down, left, and right, well, naturally, if you want to go to the window above, you'd use Control W K to, to go up. And it's just like a tiling window manager at this point, and it's super useful. So I got two windows here. I can do Control W down to go here, Control W V to make a new vertical split, Control W S to split yet again. I can say split, I don't know, proc partitions. I can take a look at that file. Control W C will close whatever window my cursor's in. Control W O will make my current window the only window. It's really, really great. Especially if you've got a nice big monitor and you've got a nice small font, you can see everything you need to see all at once. So naturally you're going to ask, well, okay, hey, if I can see two files at the same time, can I compare them? Better question, can my editor compare them for me? And the answer is, of course, silly. So here's the uh, final draft of my um, improvement to Jabberwocky. Um, it's going to be a re-release in Stunning 3D, courtesy George Lucas. And I've gone through and changed all the silly Lewis Carroll nonce words for silly George Lucas nonce words. And then the Jabberwock, you see here, I replaced that with Jar Jar Binks, because if there's anybody that needs to be decapitated, it's that guy. All the lines that I've changed are magenta. Um, the words are red. If you're on GVIM, you can get better color schemes. Or on a 256 colored kernel, you can get better color schemes than this. This is just vanilla out of the box. But, you know, if I needed to put changes from this buffer to the other one, you got commands to do that. I can do DP to push the difference over to the other side. Or if I want to do the other sense, I can say DO to pull the other side over here. You know, it's really great. Check the demo.txt file. It'll tell you a few more of those commands. It's a really good way to manage your merges. Visualization, visual mode. Um, it's interesting because VI itself was a visual mode of X, the line editor. In Vim, we've got yet another visual mode, which is how we highlight text. It's a really convenient and flexible way to select blocks of text that don't quite fit into the normal um, like operator motion, like th that kind of a motion. It's, and it's also kind of nice sometimes just to see what you're doing. Um, it's also the only way to select a block of text, like a rectangle of text. A lot of these uh, new trendy editors have um, multiple cursors now. That's the new must-have feature. And they're a little bit muggly in their implementation, so I don't favor it a whole lot. But also, all the stuff that they do with multiple cursors, we've been able to do in Vim, at least since Vim version 3, with visual block mode or the plain old substitute command. So let me show you some of the stuff that they like to do. Come over here, and I want to rename all of these array references from elements to something else. Well, I can do that in fewer keystrokes. Or another thing that you can do with multiple cursors is I want to add another different expression into this array dereference operation. Well, control V, go down a few lines. I can add I to it. That covers a lot of the use cases that I'll show you on the cool videos. I mean, I got to admit, multiple cursors is kind of fun. It does feel cool to see I type one character, but like a dozen enter into the text. That looks really cool. It makes you feel pretty awesome. But when you use it for a little while, you kind of realize in making it look pretty, it's just really not, it's really not actually that useful. You know, a lot of the use cases are less useful than a regular expression search because you got to hit Control D a whole bunch of times or like Alt F3 or something. And it's like really slow to the implementation. If you get a big log file like the ones I hack on, it's just painful. But any dang ways, visual block mode, you guys. Learn about that one. That will change your life. That's a really good one. If you're in visual block mode, you uh, select some text, and you've got a beginning point and an ending point. If you use capital I to move the cursor, usually it's going to take you to the beginning of the line. In visual block mode, it takes you to the beginning of the block, so you can prepend text to your selection. And then analogously, capital A takes you to the end of the selection. Much like in regular mode, capital A takes you to the end of the line. I just point that out because little i and little a don't quite work in visual mode like you would expect. So they've got to be capitalized. But Super awesome, super awesome stuff. Who knows what the three virtues of a good programmer are? It's a Larry Wall quote. Anybody name those? Anybody heard of those? Laziness is one of them. That's uh, right there. Good, you can read. You got laziness, hubris, and impatience. As a programmer, those are good virtues to have because they lead you to think about having the computer do all that boring stuff so you don't have to do manual labor. That's, that's why we're all in IT, because we don't like working outside, right? Am I right? Okay, insert mode completion. 
If you're in a file, you hit Control N, and it's going to, you know, complete your keyword. This is kind of standard fare in, in um, editors these days. Control X, Control F. So you're, you're in insert mode. You're typing the name of a file. How many times have you written a program that uses a file but you spelled the name of the file wrong so your program doesn't work? Okay. Control X, Control F. It'll autocomplete file system paths so you don't have to have those typos ever again. There's a lot of ways you can complete stuff. If you're like me and you're a bad speller, I'm in insert mode and I spelled this wrong. Control X, S will do spelling completion. Okay. You got your little window here. You can see all the stuff. Control X, Control V does Vim keywords. So, like I talked about before, you're in command line mode here. I'm starting to type, oh, what command was that? Buff something. Oh, Control X, Control V, and it's going to give me possibilities. Okay? So, basically, the main thing you want to remember if you're typing stuff, Control N is your friend. It's going to auto populate a list of words that are already in any of the files you have open on the theory that most likely that's the kind of stuff you want to type. So how do we learn to be good at something? Is it this easy? You just jack into the matrix and take the red pill and you know everything? Well, it's a little bit of work. But you've got to keep in mind what my man Tom Haverford says. Sometimes you've got to work a little in order to ball a lot. Learning Vim's a step-by-step -step process. I recommend doing it one bit at a time. But after getting started, I recommend the cold turkey method. Just dive into it. Tell a lot of people you're going to do it so you can't just wuss out and you know, shamefully go back to whatever you're doing before. With the, with the 10 tips I'm teaching today, hopefully the learning curve is not going to be so intimidating and you're going to get up to speed really fast. But I say stick with it for a month. At the end of that month, if you do go back to your other editor, hopefully you're going to be hitting escape too much and typing W colon WQ in all your files. Because the point here is you're making it into muscle memory. Once you've learned it, you don't need to relearn it. It's just like riding a bike. You don't have to think about it anymore. And that's the part of the learning curve that well, it's not a learning curve. I like to call it the experience curve because once you've got that experience and you're not thinking about it anymore, then it's not a problem. It's automatic. It's a reflex. The thing I notice with a lot of people that are good at Vim, they'll get to this point on the chart and they'll stop. It's usually the point where they learn the redo operator. They can hit dot and tell Vim to redo the same thing they just did but you know, somewhere else. And they think, oh my goodness, I'm so much better than I'll ever be with Notepad and they quit learning. Don't do that. There's a lot of features in Vim. You just got to keep trying them out, and you'll, you'll learn lots of new things. You'll always progress, but it builds on the stuff you already know. So it's not even a difficult thing. It's not even hard. All right, so the last feature, the one thing I want you to remember from this, if you don't remember anything else, remember this thing, and you're just going to be so awesome, and you'll be doing stuff so much faster. Well, let's just talk about it. Text objects. Who's heard of text objects? Okay, perfect. So I'm going to show you something new. In the, in the COM scheme of things, these kind of fit into the motion category, but they're not motions. They don't move the cursor. But it goes back to the idea that we've got names for certain structures in our text. We've got quoted strings. We've got brackets. We've got blocks of code. We've got tags. If we've got names for these things and we can kind of give it an idea, we should have our editor can comprehend text the same way that we do, right? So we can be speaking the same language. That's what text objects do. So right here I got a bit of um, JavaScript I pulled off the B-Sides web page. I've got lots of things in here I've got. Uh, parentheses, I've got some literal strings, I've got some blocks of text, I've got tags. Wouldn't it be nice if I could tell Vim to like delete everything or highlight everything inside this block? Or, you know, I've got this function call, I want to change what's happening in here. What if I could just, doesn't matter if I put my cursor at the beginning of the argument or at the end of the argument or on the opening paren, as long as I'm in the parens somewhere, I could just tell Vim, do something with these parens. And I can with the text object. So the way it works, you give it an operator. So that's going to be one of yank, delete, change, visual mode. Then another letter, I for inside, meaning inside whatever thing I'm going to tell you next, or A for a, uh, like a uh, entire thingamajig. Then just another character to tell it what thingamajig is. If it's a parenthesis, well, type a parenthesis. If it's a quote mark, just type one of the quote marks, square braces in this uh, like index dereference here, VA square brace. I'm going to highlight everything inside the square braces and the square brace. In three characters, I've told it to highlight, well, here, three characters. That's a bad example. How about this block of code, VA curly brace? Now I can just refactor this whole function, or I don't like XML. I, I'm more of like a JSON guy or whatever. So for me, I, I would just assume delete it all. 
So D A T for tag, delete a tag. My life just got simpler, no more XML. So if you guys don't remember anything else, remember delete all the XMLs. And then you will be a text editing cyborg. And when you get the hang of text objects, I mean, it really feels like you're in a ghost in the shell and you're just hacking away because, oh man, it's a great feeling. You didn't even need to touch the mouse to do all that. So here at the end of things, we're at the end of our wizarding journey. I hope you've realize that VI isn't hard, it just seems hard, but it's really pretty simple. With these 10 features, you've got enough idea of how to edit your text that you can do it super efficient, super fast. The great thing about a lot of these features is they kind of build on each other, they complement each other. It creates a whole entire system that, it's, it's not just a text editor, it's like a REPL, an REPL, you know, like you got in Python or Ruby or Lisp where you're just interactively editing stuff. I mean, that's what VI is for text. Pick up new features. Make it a point every week to just find some new feature, you know, read a blog or read the help file, and just put it into your workflow. Go out of your way to do it. If you do it the muggly way, hit undo and go back and do it the new wizarding way. After a week, it's either going to be muscle memory and you're not thinking about it anymore, in which case you're saving time, or it doesn't fit your flow and then just move on to something else. I mean, heaven knows there's plenty of features in VI. You're not going to run out anytime soon. But before we part, now that you've gotten your wizard hat and a, I guess a crystal ball for some reason. You're well on your way to becoming a text editing wizard, but I want to leave you with one final piece of advice. Yeah, I know you're waiting for that. All right, you can find me online. I'm, I got an email address. I'm on Freeno to hang out in like the Vim channel, the NeoVim channel, DC801. My slides are on my website, so you can go fetch those later. Thank you for listening.